Hi everyone, uh, my name is Bella Lack and before I start I just want to thank Janie and the whole team at the London Climate Change Festival for organising this and I know how much hard work, how much time and effort was poured into this event um, and obviously under these unfortunate circumstances everything's been moved virtually. Um, so thank you for making that transition to a virtual conference and for allowing it to continue. Um, I'll introduce myself a bit. I'm Bella Lack. I'm 17 and I'm an environmental activist. I began uh, doing campaigning when I was about 11 or 12 because I watched a video about palm oil and the video was all about the effects on other species such as orangutans and when I watched it I was just so heartbroken and shocked at how we could be causing so much devastation and destruction to a species so alike to us. Um, so when once I watched that, I began to do campaigning on social media, primarily Twitter. And obviously, when you're on that platform of social media, everything is so interconnected and you learn that. You learn about um, the causal effects of climate change on biodiversity loss. You learn about the links between the loss of species and the climate crisis. And so I began to campaign about the environment uh, more generally. And for the past six months I've been making a documentary with uh, Jane Goodall and a French director called Cyril Dion and it's all about the sixth mass extinction. The, doc the documentary's name is Animal and it's about hope and solutions and creating a new narrative because lots of the, uh, the dominant dialogue has been about how we can denounce the current system and what's wrong with the current system so what we're trying to do is create a narrative because we think that people need to have a vision of the future if we're going to move away from the place we're at at the moment and talking about the place where we're at at the moment is a bit of what i'm going to be doing in the next 10 minutes or so because i was originally going to speak about the campaigning i do and the documentary and some of what that entails but i've been trying to use this um crisis that we're facing as a springboard for change. I think we have to use it as an opportunity to stand back, to reevaluate why what we were doing before was so flawed, and to really better the core of our species and our society, and to peel ourselves away from the lives that we were living and examine what was creating so many problems. And all of our routines have been sort of softened and slowed down, and this is if anything, the time to do it. So even amidst the horrors of what we're facing, there is a slither of hope because it has shown us that as a species, we can unite behind the science um, as rapidly as possible. It's shown us that we can prioritize welfare, health and life over the economy and over the constant perpetual economic growth. Because up until this point, we've been plowing on with business as usual, feeling admittedly quite invincible understandably that's the human condition we felt invincible because many of us have been secure in houses we felt like we have a secure healthcare system um, we felt uh, comforted by money or by access to water and food whenever we want it and suddenly lots of that's been stripped away and it's knocked a little bit of humility into us because we've realized we've made the connection um, between us and other species we realize that we're not exempt from these biological laws and if we continue to exploit the natural world undoubtedly it is going to affect us um, and I say that because obviously coronavirus is a zoonotic disease meaning it was transferred from an animal from a non-human animal to a human whether that was a pangolin or a bat I don't know um, but scientists do know it was zoonotic so that's what I think we can learn from the virus and something which we can bear in mind as we move forward as we're forced to confront the environmental crisis head on but what does that mean for the movement what does that mean for our species more generally well firstly i think the most important is the necessity to unite behind the science as rapidly as possible and with the coronavirus this this new phrase has all has been welcomed into our dialogue and that's flattening the curve. None of us had heard of this before and now everyone knows about flattening the curve and it's something which climate scientists have actually been talking about for a long time. There's a striking similarity because there's a curve called the Keeling curve 
and it shows the accumulation of carbon dioxide in the Earth's atmosphere based on measurements taken at one observatory on the island of Hawaii from 1958 to the present day, to 2020. And it's very similar to the sort of graphs that we're seeing with the coronavirus, because with both graphs, there are windows of opportunity, there are tipping points. Um, for example, in 2018, the study came out from the UN saying we have 12 years to limit catastrophic climate change. Um, and that's one environmental window of opportunity. And obviously, there are coronavirus windows of opportunity. And we've seen, for example, in Germany, the death rate, the fatality rate has been very low because they've united behind the science. They've done early widespread testing and treatment. They've had intensive care beds and they followed social distancing guidelines. So it's a great parallel which is going to have to be reflected in our response to the environmental crisis because most the most successful countries in terms of a pandemic with the lowest death rates are those who act preemptively and listen to the health officials. And the most successful countries in terms of the environmental crisis will also be those who act preemptively and listen to the climate scientists the next thing that we can take from this is rediscovering community. We've seen all over the world, in every afflicted and affected country, there's been a resurgence of the communal spirit. And in the UK, we've begun to clap for the NHS regularly. In Spain and Italy, there have been mass workouts and mass sing-alongs from Balcony. In France, they've begun to clap for their health workers. And it's not just Europe, it's in every country which has been affected. And there will have to be um, a parallel in the environmental movement, the recognition that there are local solutions to global problems. And I have a really great quote from a man called Rob Hopkins, who founded the Transition Network. Um, and the Transition Network is a grassroots community project which aims to increase self-sufficiency and sustainability in local communities. And he says, if we wait for the government, it'll be too late. If we act as individuals, it'll be too little. But if we act as communities, it might just be enough, just in time. We have to have individual and governmental change as well, but I think there is lots of unrecognised power in the action of a community. And um, the Transition Network does things like supporting the emergence of local currencies, of local food projects and urban farms, and supporting the generation of energy um, in a community and it's happening in Brixton and Manchester and Totnes in Liverpool in East London um, it's happening all over the UK and now it's expanding across the world so those two lessons I've discussed are lessons which many environmentalists many conservationists and activists have been trying for years to get people to recognize um, to get people out of normal mode and in a sense into emergency mode which has happened for the coronavirus and now is happening for the environment. But having said that, it's really clear that fear and despair are unsustainable. And amidst the fear that we feel about the environment, we must also cling on to hope and we must create our own hope through action. And obviously, this isn't none of this is what I planned on doing. So I'm going to end in, in an even more spontaneous, unplanned way by giving you some success stories to remind us all of the power of action and remind us what we need to do when we've overcome this pandemic. The first exciting story was published by scientists in the journal Nature and then last week publicised in The Guardian and it is that oceans can be restored to their formal glory within the next 30 years by 2050. And this is a monumental recognition by scientists because for years we've been hearing about the pollution from farms and our single-use plastics pouring into the ocean. We've been hearing that waters are reaching record high temperatures and that destructive fishing is over-exploiting fish stocks. In fact, one third of fish stocks are being over-exploited. And none of that has stopped. In fact, many of those practices are increasing. However, this recognition by scientists of the ocean's ability to heal itself if we reduce the exploitative forces means that by 2050, within many of our lifetimes, we could have an ocean brimming with life like it was many years ago. And the way to do this is not to carry on as we're going, but to redouble our conservation efforts. And 
to expand protection to 30% of the world's oceans by 2030. In fact, the UK has already adopted this target of creating marine protected areas and other countries are beginning to join on. But right now, we're at about 7.4% of protected areas in the ocean. It was about 0.9% in 2000. So there has been an increase, but to get to 30 percent by 2030 we need to really really ramp up and redouble the conservation efforts but the fact that there's a recognition we can get there is incredible and definitely provides hope for us to cling on to in these times okay i'm going to whiz through the others because i have quite a few positive stories i want to share with you and the second is that house sparrow populations are flocking back to british gardens the population um, was found to have increased at the big garden bird watch earlier this year and the Big Garden Bird Watch happens every year. It's a really valuable piece of citizen science, so I really recommend you get involved with it. Um, and it found this year there had been a 10% increase in house sparrows and many other British songbird populations are also increasing. The next really exciting story is that the world's wind power capacity grew by a fifth last year in 2019. And... Now, something a bit more conservation-based is that African black rhino populations have risen by several hundred because of uh, increased protection, because of relocation groups and law enforcement. And as you can see through all of this, when people begin to mobilise and when action begins to happen, things do change. And the reason I'm telling you this is because every crisis must be treated like a crisis. And I don't want to sit here asking people to campaign for the environment at the moment because our governments should be pouring most of their resources, time and energy into fighting the coronavirus. And when it's over, we must expect them to do the same. We must expect the same mobilisation to happen for our planet. Because after all, the coronavirus is afflicting humans, but the environmental crisis will afflict humans much more severely and also deeply affect the rest of life on Earth. Something I found really interesting is that in Chinese, the word crisis is made up of two words, danger and opportunity. This coronavirus crisis is a great danger to public health, but it's also an opportunity to sit back and to reevaluate. And the environmental crisis is a great danger to all life on Earth, but it's also an opportunity for change. And change is something which we must do.